Once again, I'm asking you please to open your Bible to the fourth chapter of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. And once again, I'm going to tell you that we believe that the Bible is the divinely inspired, infallible word of the living God, inerrant in the original autographs. The Bible does not contain the word of God. The Bible is the word of God. And within the Bible is everything we need to know for what we are to believe and how we are to behave. And the Bible is the final authority for every Christian in all matters of faith and practice. Now last week we invested some time in verse 19 of this chapter, chapter 4 of Ephesians, where we read these words, they having become callous have given themselves up to indecent behavior for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. And we saw that this verse is absolutely packed with devastating statements about people, about problems, and about practice. And we saw the Greek word for callous is the same word from which that English word analgesic is derived, which means something which takes away pain. And we saw that in verse 19, that word is used metaphorically uh, to mean being insensitive to honor or shame. All of us as human beings hate pain. One of us recently has experienced quite a bit of pain and subsequent surgery. But pain has a purpose. It warns us it tells us in our body that something is wrong. It, it causes us to experience caution. And losing the sensation of touch and pain in your hands means you could very easily and quickly uh, damage yourself or cut yourself or burn yourself and cause considerable harm to your body. The, the problem with sin is that men enjoy the pleasures of sin for the moment, but they're never satisfied with sin. And they can't be satisfied. Because of that, the scripture says they become abandoned to sin, somewhat like a drug. And as we looked at verse 19 carefully with understanding, we saw that there's a clear progression downwards, a spiral that culminates in an abominable description of their warped, indecent, and despicable behavior, which, if not checked, we saw with a solemn thought that God gave them up. This morning, we're going to move on in the text to verses 20 through 22. But you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former way of life, you are to rid yourselves of the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. Once again, we find that one of these verses, verse 20, begins with a conjunction, but. Let me remind you once again that the division of the text of Scripture into verses is not part of the original manuscripts or autographs, but has been added by the translators in their desire to help us in our understanding of God's Word. The word, but serves to make it immediately very clear there's something coming next that is very different to that which has preceded it. It's making clear that there's a complete contrast between the new self and the old self, which we saw described in verses 17 through 19. So when we come across a contrast like this, we need to think about the change of direction that is making very, very clear here. The complete phrase reads, but you did not learn Christ in this way. Now we need to make sure, of course, that we understand uh, to whom the word you refers. 
And in writing, but you, Paul makes it clear that he's addressing the Gentiles in the church at Ephesus who had come to saving faith in Christ and drawing attention to their present state as true Christian believers in stark contrast to the people that have been described in the earlier verses. And when he writes, you did not, he's being very emphatic. He wants to make sure there's no misunderstanding. He continues then, I believe quite interestingly, by using the word learn Christ. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If you look at verse 20 and 21 closely, you're going to see that they contain three different words that all refer directly to thinking. There's no accident in this, or in fact, in any other part of Holy Scripture. Paul knows what we think is really important because what we think directly controls our actions. Scripture makes this very clear. Proverbs 23, verse 7. For as a man thinks within himself, so is he. Isaiah 53. All of us like sheep have gone astray and each of us have turned to what? His own way. Proverbs 21, 2. Every person's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord examines the hearts. Job 33, verse 10. He knows the way I take, and when he has put me to the test, I will come out as pure gold. The Bible speaks of two very different ways. It speaks of a narrow way. It speaks of a broad way. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is narrow, and the way is constricted that leads to life. And there are few who find it. So there's an implication in the text here that Paul believes that some of his readers had begun to drift back into their old, unregenerate ways before they came to faith in Christ. And what he's doing is trying to correct their defective thinking and get them back on track. So he continues by using this really interesting phrase when he refers to their present position and how they arrived at it. Verse 20. But you did not learn Christ in this way. Did you notice it? I did. He didn't say, you did not learn about Christ. He didn't say, you didn't learn of Christ. He simply says, you did not learn Christ. And that's really interesting. I'll tell you why. Because for once, it's, it's a phrase that's not found anywhere else in the entire Word of God. And one other thing that's important. Christ here doesn't stand for the doctrine of Christ. Christ is actually the subject of his own message. The word learn means to gain knowledge, to gain understanding, or a skill. By instruction. The basic meaning is directing your mind to something that will produce an external effect. So, depending on the context, of course, the learning can be through instruction, it can come through inquiry, or practice, or experience. Or today, we would probably say, or even searching on the internet. The underlying thought, though, is to genuinely understand and accept a teaching as true and to apply it in your life. So the question immediately comes up, so when did they learn 
Christ. They did not learn Christ by the natural mental processes that led to the degradation of the unsaved Gentiles. They learned to follow him as his disciples from the gospel. Christ teaches men to renounce sin and vice and to cultivate holiness and virtue. You did not learn Christ in this way. Verse 20. Something else to notice here. Paul didn't say, you did not learn Jesus in this way. By using his title, Christ, he makes it very clear he's referring directly to the anointed one, the Messiah. Many of you know already that Christos is the Greek equivalent of the transliterated Hebrew word Messiah. So just as a Jew learned the Torah, now the Christian learns Christ. These Gentiles didn't previously have any knowledge of Christ because they were separate from him. Now he's the very essence of the content of the preaching they'd heard and the sum of the instruction they'd received and the knowledge that they had gained at the time of their conversion. Paul wrote about it in his first epistle, to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 22 through 24. Indeed, the Jews ask for signs, the Greeks search for wisdom, but, and here's the clear distinction and difference, we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Gentiles, foolishness, but, but to those who are called, specified here, to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And he added to that in the second chapter of his first epistle to the Corinthians. In verse 2 he said, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Notice that in his reference to Jesus Christ crucified, Paul is making it abundantly clear that he never apologized for and always preached the cross, something which is sadly lacking and often completely missing in much popular preaching today. When Paul refers to their learning Christ, he's really saying that Christians are not to live in the same way that all the rest of the people of the world live. In fact, he's asking them a question at this point, which is the title for the message this morning. The question he's asking is, what are you thinking? You were this way, now you are completely different. So what are you thinking when you start to go back to your old ways, your old habits, and your old sin? What in the world are you thinking? You've come out from the world and you ought to show the world an example of the Christ life. You're no longer to walk as the Gentiles walk. You who have learned Christ should put away all the evil things of your former life and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You did not learn Christ in this way. Verse 21, if indeed. Those two words are, are really interesting because they're actually a way of seeing that or since or in the light of the fact. If indeed is, is what we would call a conditional clause. That means it's viewed as having been already fulfilled. In other words, what is going to follow it is not in any doubt at all, but it's taken for granted. Those of you who've studied computer logic will know that every if statement must be followed by another statement, typically then. If this, then that, or this. You can't just have the if. There is an assumed expectation. There must be something that happens in consequence. And while we could read part of the text and say, well, 
in saying if indeed Paul is actually questioning the reality and the validity of their professions of faith. I don't believe that to be the case at all. The words, if indeed, are participles, which means they could actually be translated as seeing that, since, or because. Conditional clause is always viewed as having been completely fulfilled. So that means what is to come next is not in any doubt at all. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus. The Greek word for heard is akuo. It means to listen, hear with careful attention, with the mind's ear, or effectually, so that it will result in an appropriate response to what has been spoken or taught. So if someone of significance were to be speaking today and sharing information that is vitally important, he might pause and he might ask the question, do you hear what I'm saying? In fact, as a pastor, I sometimes ask that question in a variety of different ways. People come to church every week. They listen to sermons. But the important question is, do they really hear what is being said? Do you hear what I'm saying? In John 10, 27, Jesus said this, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. What does that mean? It means if you haven't heard his voice, it means if you're not hearing his voice, then maybe you're not one of his sheep. What are we as believers to do? We are to listen to Christ. We are to hear him. We are to be taught by him. Those who are not his will not hear him. If indeed, verse 21, you have heard him and have been taught in him just as truth is in Jesus. One of the important, necessary requirements and qualifications of an elder, a pastor or teacher, specified in God's word in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 2, is the ability to teach. The Greek word didasko used here for taught is similar to the other word uh, didactic, which uh, speaks more to the approach or method used in teaching. Didasko means to provide instruction in positive truth in either a formal or informal setting. And while this is normally the responsibility of elders and pastors, Paul tells us in Colossians 3, 16, it's also the responsibility, are you listening, of every believer. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. It's also part of the Great Commission, recorded in Matthew 28, verse 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Listen, teaching them to follow all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Notice also he didn't say, I will be with you always. He said, I am with you always. One more important thing is about this, that the teaching involved here is expected to be by word of mouth. And almost without exception in the New Testament, that word didasco refers to the teaching of groups. It also means to teach in such a way that the will of the student or the hearer becomes conformed to that which is being taught. That means the teacher must teach in such a way that as the student is taught, he now changes his mind. 
In essence, he says, I won't do it this way, but I will do it this way because I've learned this doctrine, this teaching, this part of God's holy word. Are you listening? Are you hearing? What we believe directly determines how we behave. Are we being conformed to this world or conformed to God? Sound biblical preaching is not intended to be entertaining or merely the communication of information. It must always result in transformation. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This will create disciples who live in responsive obedience to God's holy word. If indeed, verse 21, you have heard him and have been taught in him just as truth is in Jesus. That little phrase in him is really interesting also because most of us writing this would probably express it differently. We would probably say uh, as we have been taught by him or taught about him. We probably wouldn't say as you have been taught in him. I believe this refers directly to what we call today our union with Christ. The underlying idea of the text here is that union with Christ and in fellowship with Christ, they received instruction. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus. Back in verse 20, we look carefully at the phrase, learn Christ. And we saw that refers directly to his title as the Messiah. But at the end of verse 21, we find that Paul now is using his name, Jesus. So what we have here in this passage of Holy Scripture is the attestation of the God-man. His title, Christ, speaks of his deity, his name, Jesus, speaks of his perfect humanity. John 1.17, the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. John 14.6, the well-known verse, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Commentator Blakey says, truth is the property of being in accord with fact or reality as defined by God. Whatever God says is truth. Truth is a person, Jesus. Jesus said, I am the truth. Truth is the correspondence between a reality and a declaration which professes to set it forth. To say it another way, words are true when they correspond with objective reality. Persons and things are true when they correspond with their profession of them. Since God himself is the ultimate great reality, that which correctly sets forth his nature is preeminently the truth. So by using his name, Jesus, Paul is emphasizing his, his humanity. And when he does that, that inevitably has to bring to our minds his holy conception, his virgin birth, his incarnation, and his sinless, spotless life here on earth. <laughs> In complete contrast to the way the Gentiles walk, and about which Paul has been very clear in his description in earlier verses, 17 through 19. 
Verse 22, in reference to your former way of life, you were to rid yourselves of the old self as being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. Their former way of life was a life of sin and a life in sin. It was lived according to the debased standard of this world, of the flesh and of the devil himself. Their former manner of life was the unregenerate, unclean, unholy life of a sinner under the domination of the old man or the old nature. Now, if you were with us when we were in chapter 2 of this epistle, you'll remember that Paul repeatedly reminded the Ephesian believers of their former way of life. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, he says this, You were dead in your offenses and sins in which you previously walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit which is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all previously lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were but by nature children of wrath, just as the rest. That's how they were before coming to faith in Christ. Now, as believers in Christ, they have an important responsibility. And it is to this responsibility that Paul is calling them in verse 22. In reference to your former way of life, you are to rid yourselves of the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. I'm going to be right up front with you about this. For many Christians, this this phrase, rid yourselves of the old self, has been difficult to understand. Uh, and people find it difficult to reconcile with some of the other things that have been communicated by the Apostle Paul. In fact, it's proved not only to be difficult, it's proved to be quite puzzling for some people. For example, they'll refer to Romans chapter 6 and verse 6. And reading that verse, we find, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. There's been a lot of misunderstanding about this verse and how to reconcile what initially appears to be contradictory statements. Since we believe in the verbal and plenary inspiration of Holy Scripture, we know for a fact there are not and cannot possibly be any contradictions in the sacred text of Holy Scripture. But the problem arises when people reading Romans 6, 6 say, well, if our old self was done away with, why is Paul now saying to the Ephesian Christians, we must rid ourselves of the old self? It's a good question. So let me try to shed a little light on the subject for you. Our old man has already been crucified with Christ. That is an historical fact and a truth that believers must continually reckon as true. Paul is saying in Ephesians that based on the fact that the old man has been crucified, we must make it our experience of putting off this old man. We could put it another way. We could, we could say it like this. <clears throat> put off in your daily walk what has already been put off when you died with Christ. You see, the old man or the old nature refers to all that we were before we were saved. At that time, we were ruled by the evil desires and practices of our old nature. Our old self was crucified with Christ. But the key fact is, that does not mean it was eliminated. It means it's now rendered powerless. And if you're thinking about this carefully, 
you're beginning to ask yourself the question, well, why does it still have to be done away with? And if you're thinking about it seriously, I'm really very pleased because it means you're paying careful attention. So let's take a closer look at this important truth. When Christ died on the cross, we died with him positionally. When he was raised up from the dead, we were raised up with him positionally. We are to reckon these facts to be true in our daily practice so that we will not yield to sin. Now because Paul, in these passages, clearly states putting off the old life as a done deal, some argue it's not something we have to go on doing now. They say, well, it, it was a once and for all, no matter what happens now. It was done, it was accomplished, it was fulfilled at the cross. But although we died with Christ, and that is absolutely true, Paul commands us to put to death our members that are on the earth. And again, there's a question. So why do we need to put to death our members if we already died? And I believe the best way to understand this is that we must daily apply experientially the facts that are true of us positionally. So yes, at the moment we were saved, we put off the dirty clothes, if you like, of the old life. But the ongoing reality is that we must reckon that this is so by putting off everything associated with the old life and putting on the new life in Christ. One of the men who had a great impact on my life in earlier years was Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. I used to sit in Westminster Chapel in London and listen to him expound the word of God. And Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones uses a very helpful illustration uh, regarding this matter. When Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, they were officially free from their many years of servitude. But what happened was interesting because many of them went on living as though they were still slaves. Now the president's proclamation gave them legal standing as free citizens. It was a done deal. They were no longer slaves. But out of habit, and because of many years of thinking a particular way, a lot of these poor people still lived like slaves. What they needed to do was live in accordance with the new facts. When they were tempted to think like a slave, they needed to say, no, the truth is that now I am a free man. They needed, in other words, to appropriate that truth into their daily experience. Paul writes in Romans 6, verse 14, an emphatic statement. Sin shall not have dominion or be master over you. Why? For you are not under the law, but under grace. So let me ask you, what are you thinking? Are you still a slave to sin? Are you going to continue to live in defeat with sin as your master? Or are you going to respond and recognize the glorious truth contained in the text this morning and apply it daily in your life. What we're talking about here is very simple. It's really an exhortation to practical holiness in every phase of our daily lives. Our thinking, our speaking, our looking, our hearing, 
our walking. And as I thought about the conclusion this morning, I became profoundly aware there's really only one way to do so. And that is to quote the thrilling words of 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 57. What are those words? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ.